faculty of Augsburg College, honored guests, friends who have come to share this with us, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to this centennial symposium here at Augsburg College. You may be aware of the fact that we have engaged ourselves in a series of symposia during the years preceding the 100th anniversary of this institution, which God willing we will ce celebrate in 1969. Last year, our centennial symposium concer concerned itself with the challenge of the city. And I think those of you who were here will reflect upon that and remember that we had a most stimulating and beneficial symposium. Today, our topic, World Starvation, Disaster in the 70s. And I can assure you that we have splendid intellectual fare for a symposium on starvation. My only concern today is whether or not we are capable and willing to face this topic with its deep note of tragedy. You all look too well fed. I remember an eminent American conductor once being asked, do you think America will ever produce any great musicians? He replied, no, because there's too much to eat. I trust, however, that we come with an intellectual appetite and with consciences that are sensitized so that we will be able to involve ourselves as completely as possible in the consideration of the topic which has been set for this symposium. The program is intended to give a triple thrust. We want to face as fully and completely as we can the problem. We want to, as far as we are able, to probe the solutions. And we want also to confront honestly our moral responsibilities in the light of this topic. You have the program in front of you. We invite you to these sessions. Tomorrow morning, Dr. Charles Malik of Lebanon will be our speaker from this platform. Tomorrow evening, the symposium banquet with Mr. Thomas Ware, the chairman of the board of International Mil Minerals and Chemical Corporation will be the speaker, and Dr. Malik will bring the final address in the symposium tomorrow evening here in this auditorium at 8.30. There are tickets yet available for these sessions. Tickets for the symposium banquet must be secured in the Public Relations Office in Science Hall before 2 p.m. today. And I hope that you will avail yourselves of the opportunity to attend this uh, part of the symposium. Tickets for the symposium sessions on Friday, both morning and evening, are available at the information desk in the Science Hall. Today, our speaker will be introduced by the chairman of our political science department, Dr. Miles Stenschel. And after Dr. Heilbrenner has spoken, Dr. Stenschel will conduct the discussion period. It is my privilege at this time, therefore, to welcome you and to introduce Dr. Miles Stenschel, Chairman of the Department of Political Science at Augsburg College, who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Stenschel. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I'm not going to sp take a lot of time this morning talking about our speaker because he speaks very well for himself. I'm not going to go through the list of very significant books which he has written. You can find the titles on the cards in the uh, catalog of the library. I do, however, want to say something about this very singular man. John Maynard Keynes, as those of you who have read uh, Dr. Halboner's uh, first great book, The Worldly Philosophers, will know, was a sort of teacher to economists. 
He spoke a language which economists speak and could understand. Some people had been trying to say the things which he had said, but those things did not rub off until Keynes spoke. I'm afraid that if Keynes had been the only one who had spoken, however, none of the rest of us would have understood what was going on. Into the breach came Robert Heilbronner, and I think that his role is particularly that of a very great teacher to America, a teacher particularly in the area of economics and economic thought, but a teacher whose ideas range very broadly throughout the social sciences which uh, attach to the sciences. He does not ignore the scientists by any means, and who is very interested in literature and uh, well, let us say writing. He told us last evening that his first idea was to major in English, to be a writer. And he says he was sidetracked. He was not. He happens to have written beautiful books uh, on many wonderful subjects. I'm only a little bit sorry that he did not stay with one other thing he tried before he settled into his economic groove, namely political science. He was, as he said, a little too bored with that. Well, I've tried to make it uh, impossible for some of my students to become too bored with that because I have introduced them to a little bit of economic thought by introducing them to Robert Heilbronner. I know those of you who were in my classes last fall, those of you who have been in other classes that have studied his works, read his books, will be particularly interested to meet this man in person. But I know that all of us will learn from him because he is, I think, a wonderful teacher to us in our time. Dr. Heilbronner will be speaking on an American dilemma under development and the challenge of communism. Dr. Robert Heilbronner. <clears throat> President Anderson and Dr. Stenchel, thank you for that nice introduction. I have the uneasy feeling standing here that I'm about to tell you something you know, at least know in your hearts. And this reminds me of a story, if you'll forgive me, uh, concerning a, an apocryphal Turkish character whose name, as near as I can get it, is Nazar Ed Din, who lived in the bygones and is the subject of many delightful Turkish tales, of which one tells how this traveling philosopher jester came to some little town in the middle of Anatolia, riding on his tiny donkey. He was a very tender-hearted man and therefore always carried the saddlebags on his shoulders when he sat in the donkey. <laughs> and the townspeople beseeched him to stay and talk to them at their weekly meeting in the mosque. And he said, really, he didn't want to, but they said, yes, he had to, so he did. And the first Sunday he gathered and all the village people were in the mosque and there was a long silence. And finally, one of them plucked up his courage and said, aren't you going to speak to us? And he said, don't you know what I'm going to tell you anyway? And they said, no. And he said, ignorance is bliss. And away he went. Well, that, he, wouldn't, he couldn't get away with that. So they made him stay another week. And the next week he came, and again the long silence. And again, someone plucked up his courage and said, aren't you going to speak to us? And again, the question, don't you know what I'm going to tell you? And this time, not to be outdone, they said, yes, we do. He said, in that case, why tell it? But <laughs> that wouldn't do either. So he stayed another week, and the third confrontation came, and again the questions, and again, don't you know? And this time, surely not to be outdone, the spokesman said, well, some of us do, but some of us don't. Good, said Nazareth Din. Let those who do tell those who don't. That's what I recommend for today. My topic is economic development and communism, and both those words are terrible, mis terribly misleading. And indeed, what I've got to talk about, it seems to me, is what we mean by economic development and what we mean by communism. Economic development is the first trap, a trap which I confess to having been responsible in part to setting, 
I didn't know at the time that I wrote some of my books how ill-advised a choice of words it was. But I've since come to the era, I've, I've come to see the era of my ways, and I now know the word I should have used. And I think the instant I give you the word, you'll see it too. When you look at the underdeveloped countries, when you actually go to and look at Jamaica, Puerto Rico, India, Africa, Philippines, South America, what you see is backwardness. And what backwardness means is an absence of what we call modern life. In parts of the world, the very conception of national identity, that, 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 that element of our lives which is so much a part of being an American that we don't even think about it, is missing. Even national languages don't exist. In other parts of the world, political structures which resemble the 13th century rather than the 20th century rule the roost. In other parts of the world, village life is organized around traditions of superstition, of fatalism, of authoritarian rule as between the headman of the village and the villagers or between the husband and the family, which again have no resemblance with what we call modern life. And last and not least, of course, the economic look of the place is hopelessly backward. What all the underdeveloped countries need to do is to modernize. And modernizing means to do it means doing just those things making up just those lacks that I've mentioned. They have to become nations, some of them, this is particularly Africa. They have to develop political structures which respond to the needs of our world rather than political structures that resemble medieval Europe in 1300. They have to develop village structures, family structures, that permit free inquiry and free thought and modern ideas. And then, and only then, can they begin to do something called develop in an economic way. When you go to the backward nations, what strikes you, it seems to me, is the pervading sense of this absence of modernization. You go to, to Brazil, where I was two, three years ago. And the first thing that strikes you, of course, is how incredibly much more modern their architecture is than ours. It makes all our cities look old hat. But then you go only a few miles outside of Rio, and you are plunged into a world that reeks of centuries of changeless life, and that has no more relation at all to what we consider life as we know it. I don't only mean the fact that it's poor. That's the symptom. That's the result of all the absence of modernity. I mean the fact that the people live, relate to one another, behave, and think in ways that simply have no connection with the way Western people think, act, behave. Latin America is by no means the least modern of the backward nations. One goes to Africa and one is plunged into a world that has not yet achieved the degree of modernization of 15th or 16th century Europe. Nations and national languages haven't been established. National boundaries haven't yet been fixed. One goes to Latin America, above all, one sees political structures that resemble, I repeat, feudalism. One goes to Asia, and one is overwhelmingly struck, of course, with the, the, the absence of modern thought. There is India starving, and there, amid the starving Indians, is the world's largest population of cows, eating up, pillaging the Indian countryside, unable either to be utilized for meat or to be slaughtered because of ideas which, and of course this is all terribly, it's a terrible kind of cultural imperialism, but nonetheless, ideas which, however dear to the Indians, are impossible to maintain if India is ever to get beyond its present state. One goes to Calcutta and sees people lying in the streets, reduced almost to an animal state. And again, the, the, their 
conception of their own lot and the conception of Indian, of, of the local Indians, of their condition is something which, which bespeaks another world. What's needed first and foremost around the backward world is modernization. And the question is, how will I get it and when will it come? Modernization is a kind of imperialism. Dreadful thing to say, but it's true. If you go to the backward world, where 75% of the people are, in fact, peasants, and if you ask them what they would like to have happen, they will not tell you that they are eager to modernize. First of all, they don't know the word, but they're not. All the people want in the backward area is more or less to be left alone, to have a little less taxes, to have a little better head man in the village. They want only the life that they know and that their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers lived, and they want it to be a little bit better. What they don't know is that they can't have that simple improvement. Things are either going to get worse or they must change almost totally. Now, if we had time, modernization would come. All over the world, in those parts of the world where nations have not yet been hammered out, nationalism is on the rise. Nations are being formed under our very eyes in Africa, for example. Uh, all over the world, regimes, political regimes, linked to the land, hopelessly backward-looking, opposed to industrialism, opposed to uh, modern political participation, are slowly but surely being eroded. The winds of change are blowing. All over the world, traditional village structures are little by little giving way to the ways of the 20th century. The radio, that, that enormous instrument of change, penetrates to the back villages. People wake up to the fact that it's not necessary to repeat the ways of their elders, that there are other ways of life in, in, to, to which millions of people cleave, and that these new ways of life might be applicable to themselves. If there were time, the, the imperialism of the West, the cultural imperialism of the West, would sweep around the world, as in time it surely will. The trouble is, the great immediate trouble is, there isn't any time. That is the real crisis which we face. There isn't any time for two reasons. Partly because the peoples of the underdeveloped world are themselves beginning to get restive, only beginning, but that's the least. The real reason, as you all know, and here is what I tell you what you know, is of course the fearful, frightful population dilemma. Now I must recite some statistics. Everybody is aware, of course, these days of the population explosion. It's just a question of ringing different changes on well-known bells. Let me say a few, give you a few facts. The Foreign Policy Association recent, recently put out a little discussion brochure, uh, which, had, uh, which began nicely. It said, as I remember it, these statistics are too unbelievable to believe, but they're true anyway. They are, number one, every day 10,000 people someplace in the world die of malnutrition. And secondly, and this is the real shocker, of every 20 children born in the world in the underdeveloped areas, 10 die in infancy from lack of proper food, and of the other 10, seven will be physically or mentally retarded because of an absence of sufficient nutrition. The, the brute fact of the world is that the number of people pouring into it is so much greater than the amount of tonnage of food being added to it that if the curve of mouths and the curve of foodstuffs continues at their present rates in the 1970s there will be there must be famine affecting hundreds of millions or even possibly billions of people a famine that has been called by the food and agriculture association potentially the most colossal catastrophe in history it isn't just food, of course, that is, that is bringing this crisis upon us. To house the two billion people who will arrive on the surface of this planet 
between now and the year 2000 to house them. And by housing, I mean putting up some corrugated tin sides for them to live inside and under. To house them will require building as many structures in the next 40 years as have been built in the whole recorded history of the human race. The population pressure not only augments sheer numbers, but it acts in unpleasant ways in pushing those numbers around. It pushes them off the countryside where they simply cannot find enough to eat into the city where they hope by some miracle that food will grow from the sidewalks. That is why, whereas populations in the world are increasing at 2, 3, and even 4% a year, which means they double in 30, 25, 20 years. In the cities, in Latin America and in Asia, Calcutta, the, the, the possibly the greatest human cesspool now in existence, with some three to six million beings in it, will, at its present rate of increase by the year 2000, be a human or subhuman rabbit warren holding between 33 and 66 million people. Inconceivable. As a result of the fact that people are pouring into the planet so fast, it also becomes impossible not merely to feed them, or to house them, or to put them in cities, but even to give them the elements of education by which they can improve their lot. Illiteracy, despite the greatest worldwide effort at, at teaching A's, B's, and C's, Illiteracy has increased in the last 10 years by 200 million people. There are 200 million more people who can't read or write today than there were when we started the great anti-illiteracy campaign. I could go on with the figures, but I think you get the picture. The question is, what to do? What, what all this holds out by way of economic and political likelihoods? On the one hand, the overwhelming need to modernize, the fact that backward political, economic, social, sociological structures must give way to modern ones if change and then development is to take place. On the other hand, this relentless pressure of mouths that takes away the one chance for letting change seep in, that is, that makes the crisis near at hand rather than something we can postpone. Well, one thing to do, or to try to do, one thing that will be done, and that must be done, is to try and raise the output of food. The underdeveloped nations where starvation takes place are the world's least productive areas. In India, for example, gets about 900 pounds of rice out of an acre. China gets 1,600. Egypt gets 3,000. America gets much, much more. Uh, again, to take India, which is, of course, the great crying example, only about half of all the food that India raises gets to market. Now, a great deal of, the, of that other half, of course, gets eaten right by the people who grow it. But of the portion that they withhold, an enormous percentage, 25 or 35 percent, simply gets eaten up by the rats and the bugs. Uh, it's stored in old crockery jars. You see these when you look at pictures in life of Indian village. Now take a look in the back of the house, or inside the house, at the place where they keep the rice or, or the wheat, millet, whatever they raise. And it's usually a cracked old jug. And uh, the, 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 the India feeds its mice liberally. It's possible to remedy some of these practices. Not so easy as one would think. It means penetrating into backward villages where peasants traditionally, and for damned good reasons, associate visitors with taxation. Uh, and uh, they don't like people coming from the cities telling them how to keep their grain. But something could be done. Something can be done to make more food grow in these acres. Fertilizer. India uses something like 400,000 tons of fertilizer. If India is to double its crop in about 25 years, which is what she seeks to do, she will have to use at least six times as much. And if she uses 
as much fertilizer as she ought to use, that is to say Western standards, she will use all the fertilizer which is produced in all the world. So that with difficulty, and I'll talk about the difficulties again, something can surely be done to make more food available. I haven't even mentioned, of course, what we can do. The situation is changing in this country from one of shortage to one of surplus. I beg your pardon, one of surplus, one of shortage. For years, we've been overproducing on the farms and piling it up in the granaries. Then, recently, uh, as the realities of impending famine have come across to us, we've begun to ship these surpluses abroad until now the cupboard is bare. I think there's no doubt about the fact that over the next decade, as starvation begins to show up, and already, if you look at Time magazine this week, you see pictures of starving Indian children, just indescribable pictures. As these realities begin to come home, as these pictures begin to show up on the front pages of newspapers, they make great horror stories, and in life and time and all the rest. Pressures will mount for American charitable assistance, which is what it will be. And I dare say that lands that have been withdrawn from cultivation will go back into cultivation, and that the American farmer will be urged to produce as much as he possibly can. And that, too, can add its bit. The fact is, however, that even with, the, with, with an all-out American effort and with an all-out underdeveloped country effort within their capabilities, the most that can be done is to push ahead, not to obviate the eventual crossing of the two lines, the line of the number of mouths and the line of the amount of grain. If you make a chart of this, and you assume that America will indeed begin to produce, and so will the underdeveloped countries put their full efforts, then the chart of grain suddenly goes up like this, but it hits a ceiling after a while, and then the rate of increase is very slow. Meanwhile, relentlessly, the number of mouths keeps going up. So in the long run, and the long run begins, I would say, today, the only possible cure is population control. And this is a fact that has been gradually coming home to the underdeveloped countries as well as to ourselves. We've ducked it for a long time, but it's getting to be unduckable, and I must talk about it. Birth control, of course, has been practiced as long as it's been history in the upper classes. That's one of the reasons why the rich got richer and the poor got children. Uh, the difficulty has been to introduce birth control practices to lower classes. And there's a very easy reason why, particularly when you now think about life in Pakistan. There is lacking in Pakistan and in Honduras and in uh, Nigeria and in uh, Saudi Arabia. There is lacking a necessary attribute for population control, which we find among the upper classes in the Western countries. It is called the bathroom, otherwise known as privacy. Birth control requires a certain cultural attitude, a certain modesty, a certain ability to retire. When children are made in the underdeveloped world, in one room in which everybody sleeps in the same bed, uh, in which the husband turns to the wife in the middle of the night, and that is it. Uh, there's no time for all the delicate procedures that we associate with birth control in the West. Uh, even the taking of pills is a laborious business that requires some place to put them, running water, and requires, of course, a belief in medicine which, alas, is lacking rather than present in much of the backward world. That is why, until very recently, the, the, the experience of birth control in the backward countries has been heartbreaking. Birth control teams have gone into villages in Southeast Asia uh, in their nice starchy uniforms, preaching the various devices, illustrating them. The village ladies have been glad to accede after three months of effort, the thing is written up and the population 
uh, what's it called, council back in New York, 47.6% of the villagers do. And then they go away and they come back three months later and it's dwindled to 7.2%. They, they did it to please the visiting ladies, but it just doesn't work. It's too difficult. Now something new has come. And after so many years of, of, of potential panaceas for this problem, we're all a little afraid to pin our hopes on it, good as it is. That is to say, it's so good, it worries us. It's called the IUD, standing for intrauterine device. It's a little coil of plastic, which is inserted in the uterus by a nurse, usually, uh, and which stays there and inhibits conception. So that once a woman has accepted an IUD, uh, she's out of the baby market. You don't need bathrooms, you don't need privacy, you don't need all this business, you don't need another, but the day of the calendar is and all that. You're just out of the baby market until you wish to have a baby, in which case the IUD is easily removed and you're back in the baby market. The result is that it takes, so to speak, but one act of persuasion to remove a potential bearer of children from the population explosion for a long time. Now, there have been only two places where it's been tried. Uh, one is Taiwan, the other is South Korea. These are both very backward countries uh, with fantastic birth, birth records, birth rates, 3.5 percent, the kind of rates that double populations in 22 and 23 years. In both nations, a widespread effort was made to advertise and proselytize for IUDs as well as other methods. And it was discovered that there was an extraordinary acceptance of these things. Not that the peasant ladies understood much about the economic projections involved, but they just knew one thing, and that is that what they were doing in the old ways was to give, a, give birth to a continuous flow of infants who were dying, and that it would be a great deal better to break that cycle. The results of the Taiwan and the Korea experiment make it possible to believe that in about five years one can cut the birth rate by about a third, which is a colossal chop. It isn't enough. In the end, given the present low level of productivity in the backward nations, the net rate of increase has to be cut to zero, or very close to it. They've got to stand still with population for a while and let things catch up. But if they can bring, if they can throttle the Niagara down to an ordinary size waterfall, that will be some advantage, God knows. Now India is trying IUD. It is possible that this technique can buy us some time. And if it does buy us some time, then the gloomy parts of my talk, to which I'm coming shortly, uh, will not be quite so frighteningly near. Yet, I don't want to leave you with the notion that we can, so to speak, turn off the crisis. We can postpone the crisis. If a tremendous effort is made to increase food output, an effort that will take investment of billions of dollars in fertilizer plant, for example. And if a tremendous effort is made to introduce this one incredibly lucky discovery of birth control, at least in those nations to w in which there is no religious objection. And let me add another thing by that, since this is, of course, a, a delicate issue. The only nation in which there is religious objection to birth control, well, the only nation are the Catholic nations, let's say Latin, South, South America. But fortunately, the IUD does not dislodge the fertilized ovum, which would be, at least technically speaking, some kind of abortion. It just inhibits or prevents the, the, the fertilization of the ovum. At least we think so, and nobody's asking too, nobody's asking too carefully. So that, so that one sneaks around, so to speak, the theological objection. In addition, 
In Brazil alone, there are a million and a half abortions a year, which are, of course, sinful, not to say exceedingly dangerous. And these re the reality on the one hand of abortion, on the other hand of the, the theological safety of this device, uh, has, is making possible a change in Latin America. There are IUD clinics in Chile. Uh, there were delegations to the latest World Population Council from Latin America for the first time. So that something can be done. And the crisis, with good fortune, can be pushed off some. In the end, it will have to be faced. If nothing is done, we will be facing it in 10 years. If food population, I'm sorry, if food production doesn't change drastically, uh, the sheer absence of calories will begin to show up on the pages of life in the 1970s. And I must say that even with the most extravagant expectations, one can't expect the IUD to produce miracles in less than a decade or two. So a crisis is coming, although no one should be so foolish as to give it the precise year. And the question is, what is going to be done about this crisis when it arrives, when you're all 10 years older, and so am I, or 15? I think myself that there is only one way that the crisis can be surmounted. But since what I think is very radical, I want to make absolutely sure that you understand that what I think is only what I think, not what I know. The, the matter is too delicate for me to put my opinions to you as if they were the facts. So let me, let me give you the outs so that you can, you can exercise your skepticism before I give you what I think would be the answer. First, it may be that food and IUDs will push the thing off so we're not going to have this crisis. And second, it may be that the process of change that you know about, economic development or modernization, at the rate at which it is now proceeding or is likely to proceed, will do the trick. In other words, it may be, and in some countries it will be, that the existing political elites, the existing rate of of change of ideas, the existing degree of breakup of traditional structures will enable countries to cope with the problem of modernizing themselves in time. So remember that. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that they will not be, it will not be able, by way of time schedule, to postpone the crisis enough. And I think that the rate of modernization in most of the backward world will not be fast enough to avert the crisis either. So I think there's only one way it's going to happen. And that is, if some party, some indigenous movement, mounts what can only be called a jihad, the Islamic holy war against backwardness, a kind of all-out, total, monstrous, totalitarian, assault against backwardness, not just against backward elites, not just against land, landlords and all that stuff, but against the peasant life, against village structures, against superstition, against backwardness in every form. There have been such jihads, and they have been conducted mainly by the communist nations. And that's something we must understand. We spend so much time in talking about communism, talking about its political Machiavellianism, or the particular, its cultural outrages, if you will, uh, or the shifts and tax of its course, that we overlook what seems to me to be a central and all-important core of the meaning of communism as applied to the backward areas, and that is the fact that communism is first and foremost a jihad against backwardness. Communism, by which I mean the people, the, the, the communist leaders, conduct an all-out war against backwardness. Not, and by that I repeat, not just against the capitalists, 
the landlords and those people who may or may not stand in the way of modernization. They conduct that war against the peasant who is, in the end, the source of hopeless inertia. This is certainly true in Russia. One has to go back to read Chekhov, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, or any description of peasant life in Russia in 1900, 1910, any time before the revolution, to realize that peasant life in Russia was in many ways indistinguishable from that which we now find in, let's say, Turkey. It was not at the level of India ever, or China, but it was characterized by all these attributes of backwardness. Authoritarian village structures, hopeless subjugation of women, uh, traditionalism, superstition, absence of modern rationality, uh, an inability of the peasant to conceive of any life other than the life he led. When one compares those realities of the past in Russia with what one sees today, one realizes that what communism has brought Russia, regardless of what else it's brought, has been modernization. Nobody says that life in a collective farm is very jolly, and nobody says that collective farms are very efficient, because it isn't and they're not. But they are no longer little peasant villages. They are, they have been dragged, however reluctantly, into the ambit of modern life. And from the collectives go young men and women to the cities to partake of urban life more and more. And modern thoughts, modern techniques, and all the necessary paraphernalia that it takes to rescue a people from, from poverty have been implanted in Russia by communism. I think, I think the same is true in China where we can't possibly begin to make judgments yet. But I want to say this important thing. What is going on in China is the greatest mystery. One thing impresses me deeply about China, and it, it impresses me whether or not one reads a very sympathetic account, such as Edgar Snow, who goes and says China has changed irrevocably, or whether one takes the most outraged accounts of the Red Guard's rampages. Because what the Red Guard's rampages show is the same thing as what Mr. Snow says, that things have changed irrevocably. The thought, the idea that young people could revile their elders, could fly in the face of this established central tradition of Chinese life, is, to my eyes, the, most, the single most piercing revelation about the nature of what has happened in China, and that is, the old order, and I don't, again, don't just mean the landlords, they're easy. The old order, right down to the soil, has changed in some fashion or another. Now, the change may have been so brutal, the misplanning may have been so egregious, that China today may not develop. I mean, the, the change may result in famine, it may result in a great thrashing around. That I can't say. But what I believe to be true is that as a result of this jihad, of this war that communism has waged against the peasantry, and it is against too, that the, that the seeds, the foundation for future modernization have been laid. One must ask, after all, why China for a thousand years has not been able to, to move? Well, the answer is very complicated. But essentially, it's summed up by the fact that it never achieved modernization, all these things. It didn't get a modern class structure. It didn't get modern village structure. It didn't get modern family structure. It didn't get modern ideas. These things are now, it seems to me, these things can now enter. Communism in China has been, I think, and has been everywhere, the kind of electric shock treatment that you give to certain kinds of people who need this galvanic, exposure to a destructive force in order, so to speak, to break the hold of the past. The same thing strikes me true of Cuba, where again, the, the present results of the Castro regime may, I don't know what they are, they may well be miserable. But what's impressive, again, from testimony for those who like or don't like the regime, is the educational effort, the fact that Castro has made an effort to reach the campesino, the peasant, and to make him stop being so peasanty. Well, I think 
that the, the meaning of communism in the backward areas is its, above all, is its capability of mounting this kind of all-out war. One asks, of course, does it have to be communist? I don't think it does, no. There have been all-out efforts that have not involved the Communist Party. Ataturk in Turkey, uh, Jose Marti, who first was the first great liberating figure in Cuba, Nasser in Egypt, the Mexican Revolution. So that I think there, are, there is the possibility and the hope that the leaders, the elites, who will mount this jihad need not be people who are, so to speak, card-carrying Marxists. That's not essential. What is essential, I think, is that somebody do the trick. Somebody has to assault backwardness in order to shake nations into a state of readiness to make the enormous changes within their most intimate as well as at their most public lives that will be needed to bring about modern economies. But even if the leaders are not communist, that is to say, even if they have no affiliation with the Communist Party, no particular love for communism, no particular relations with China or Russia, the jihad will still have its, from our eyes, ugly aspects. It will surely be nationalistic. Every one of these movements that seeks to awaken Rip Van Winkle waves the banner of nationalism. The shouting millions you see in Havana, Peking, makes no difference, uh, in uh, Jakarta, in, in uh, uh, Leopoldville, are not uh, marching under the banner of savings and investment, thrift and enterprise, believe me. <laughs> They're marching under the banner of nationalism, which gives you that marvelous feeling of collective majesty, a personal immortality. They're also marching under the leadership of elites who recognize how little time there is, how much there is to be done, and who are utterly ruthless about doing it. Uh, who have no compunctions about jailing people, about uh, ripping apart institutions, about collectivizing economic life, about ordering people into labor brigades, who have no compu compunctions in a word about, about exercising a kind of economic and political authoritarianism or totalitarianism. And it will require a philosophy of some sort. These modernizing regimes don't just operate off the cuff. Revolutionary movements need ideas just as much as they need anything else. And the ideas must justify what they do. They must, they must preach a destination. And these ideas will surely be radical, restive, dissatisfied with the status quo as it exists in that country, and probably unable to accept as a model any of the Western countries towards which so much animus and hostility has been gathered in the past. All of these modernizing efforts will smack of communism. That's the point. They may not be communist, but they will have the, the, the overtones, the unpleasantnesses that we associate with communism. And therein, of course, lies our dilemma. One asks, is the United States opposed to economic development? Hands in the air. Ridiculous idea. Outrageous. I mean, were we not the people who invented the slogan, revolution of rising expectations? And haven't we given more generously to, far, to economic development than anybody else? The answer is yes, yes, yes. We are in favor of economic development, by which we mean a peaceful and orderly progression of backward governments into more reasonable, more prosperous conditions. And for this, we have point four, 
and the Marshall Plan, and Foreign Aid generally, and the Peace Corps, all of which are remarkable and wonderful expressions of our international and national goodwill. What we're not prepared for is that economic development might bring into being, and in fact might have to be brought into being by, the rise of jihad governments, radical, authoritarian, supranationalistic, ruthless governments. So that we have to counterbalance point four in the Peace Corps, Guatemala and Cuba and the Dominican Republic and Vietnam. Interventions, all of them, by us to unseat or prevent governments that smacked suspiciously of radicalism, not to say communism. Now the question is going to be, and an ugly question it is, if I'm right, and let me underscore the if, because I repeat, I don't want to pretend that I'm, I am expounding Aristotelian logic. If I'm right that the crisis can only be postponed, but not permanently avoided, and if I'm right that the present governments, as they exist around the world, are just not bringing change fast enough, and if I'm right that the only kind of governments that can bring about change from the village up fast enough to make possible large-scale reorganizations within nations that will result in greater production, if I'm right about these things, then communism or radical national collectivism or national socialism or some kind of word like that will describe the kinds of governments that will arise in the backward nations. And we will then be in a dilemma. On the one hand, being for economic development. On the other hand, opposed to the rise of regimes that seem to threaten us. Now, let me, having painted so stark an alternative, suggest some cautions. In the first place, I, just as I have underlined and will underline again the many ifs in this chain of thought, let me emphasize that not every underdeveloped country is in this so dire a situation. Mexico has probably made it. It had its revolution, by the way. It had its great modernizing revolution, and very bloody it was. 300,000 people were killed. It had it at a time when America wasn't so itchy about communism. Well, itchy enough, but not that itchy. Uh, Turkey, which had its modernizing revolution, may well make it. Argentina, which had under Peron a kind of revolution of a sort, and which doesn't have population problems, anything like the severity I'm talking about, has time and may well make it. Uh, there are other parts of the world in which either the pressure of mouths is not so great or the degree of flexibility of the present leadership, Chile, may be great enough so that desperation and absence of movement will not bring about a crisis. So that one must pick and choose. My prognosis applies, I dare say, to the great belt of countries along the equator to generalize. The Caribbean nations, all of them hopeless, so far as I can see. Very likely the great Brazilian, Peruvian, Bolivian complex, Ecuadorian, Colombian, where so far as I can see the degree of progress lags hopelessly behind the pace of population growth. The whole Southeast Asia mess where, despite the best efforts of the Indian leaders, who are indeed men of men and women of, the, of very great goodwill, the sort of people whom you would like to have and come teach here, these people are not able to, to shoot the cows or to put them into corrals and milk them or, or butcher them, whatever you're supposed to do. They aren't able to break the caste structure. They aren't able to reach the backward peasant. They aren't able to, to get the grain stored in tin cans instead of broken crockery. They haven't done it. 
and I'm not terribly encouraged to think that they will. So that my prognosis of the threat involves not all of the world, but just those most desperate areas where population growth is fastest and where the existing regimes, be they reactionary or liberal, simply do not seem to display the necessary, I guess it is ruthlessness, which leads me to believe that other more ruthless regimes must rise to bring the thing off. Now, this leaves us with some lessons to be learned, I think. First, I think we have to set ourselves for a spell of trouble. C.E. Black, Princeton historian, in a very good book called The Dynamics of Modernization, read, wrote, that we should be prepared for 10 or 15 revolutions a year. Well, he doesn't really mean the kind of revolution I'm talking about. He means overthrows, coups, upsets. There's a tremendous amount of instability inherent in this crisis, and we must simply be prepared for living with unpleasant headlines. I think we must be prepared for the fact that revolutions in these desperate areas that seem capable of mobilizing popular support and that seem capable of leading the country into modernity will be radical. I think we must be prepared, therefore, for the rise of governments that will make our, our own government nervous and make us, unless we have learned a great deal, frightened. This doesn't mean, it seems to me, that capitalism or the American nation is actually threatened by this situation. Threat is a funny thing, you know. To be ac actually to be threatened or just to think one is threatened is a fine line to be drawn. By actually threatened, I mean a few facts that I think it is well for us to remember. The backward nations are very, very poor. All the steel production and all the backward nations together isn't as great as that in West Germany. The backward nations are separated from us by great big oceans. So all the backward nations together, if they were in one single big army, would be a long ways away. I don't think there's an immediate military threat, even if the whole backward area went red tomorrow, God forbid. I do not think it would pose a military threat. The threat is psychological. The threat is whether it would make us feel that somehow we were engulfed or being engulfed by some great presence on the world. For that, to conquer that fear, I think we must make some second, have some second awarenesses. The first is that communism is just as bad a word to cover the realities of the world as capitalism is. The Russians talk, and the Russians and the Chinese talk endlessly about international capitalism, which always, uh, I, I wish it were true. In point of fact, when I think that the two bloodiest world wars in history were fought by capitalist, capitalist nations against one another, I yearn for the day when international capitalism will arrive. In the same way, when we talk of international communism, we're guilty of an equal oversimplification. Here are Russia and China poised at the threshold of what could be a terrible conflict. Here's the fact that Russia has already fought with Hungary, that there's all kinds of friction between Poland and, and, and Russia, etc., etc. India has, uh, China has succeeded in, 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 on the one hand, embracing, the other hand, being at, at, at the throat of Cuba. It's perfectly clear that communism is also just a conjuries of nations with national interests. The fact that there are certain underlying structural similarities, the fact that they all read Marx and put them on the top shelf, uh, isn't enough to, to justify the belief that there is a single unifying presence of communism which can bring against us a single unified foreign policy. On the contrary, I think that the very fact of economic development if and when it is brought into being by left leftish nations, will exacerbate their own national identity and lead to greater conflict among themselves. 
in addition to which, I believe that the fierceness of communism, of Chinese communism, will tend to dis dissipate if and when development takes place. It's one thing, a nation sings one tune when its whole effort is to change itself. When Russia, when, when the sole aim of the Russian Revolution was to make the, was to free the peasant from the bonds of the past, then Russia sang an endless tune of revolutionary sentiment. When Russia began to be rather pleased with itself, then the sentiment of endless change begins to sound a bit embarrassing, in fact awkward, and one begins to start to celebrate what one has. I think in the same way that development will bring a toning down of the, of the, of the tone of communist invective, which is so difficult to live with. The question is, the great question is, whether or not the American people, yourselves, and people in Congress, and people who have hands, so to speak, on the various levers of the various machines that in some fashion or other direct policy. The question is whether it will be possible for this country to accept a direction of world affairs that goes in such a different, to such a different point of the compass than that which we had expected. We really had imagined, I think, after the Second World War, that the underdeveloped countries would follow, so to speak, in our direction, that they would become democratic, more capitalistic, so to speak, more modern like us, Coca-Cola, we are, we are taken aback at the fact that modernization goes in a different direction. And it's not easy, Lord knows, for a nation to admit that it may not represent the direction of the future for other nations, at least not for a long while. I don't make easy prophecies about whether or not we will make this tolerant and difficult judgment. Let me only end with this last thought, which as a matter of fact occurred to me at President Kennedy's assassination a long time ago, and I said it on the television then. Uh, I had been reading, no, the night that Kennedy was shot, I couldn't sleep like everybody else. And I got up and somehow I pulled off my library shelf by accident a uh, Disraeli's novel, Sybil, where I turned to, again by accident, that marvelous part where some that Kennedy was shot. I couldn't sleep like everybody else. And I got up and somehow I pulled off my library shelf by accident a uh, Disraeli's novel, Sybil where I turn to, again by accident, that marvelous part where somebody whose name I forget says to somebody else whose name I forget. Uh, it talks about the war between two nations. And the second guy says, what two nations? And the, the hero says, the, the war between the two nations that exist in every country, the rich and the poor. And it struck me that th that lovely phrase applicable though it was to Disraeli's time, has to be changed for our time. There are two nations in every country, including this country, but no longer, at least in this country, no longer the rich and the poor. The nations are the rational and the irrational. The nations are those who are capable of the painful processes of thought, doubt, tentativeness, diffidence, uneasiness about their own conclusions and those who know what the answers are. If we are to make the extraordinarily difficult and delicate judgments that are implicit in my own perhaps pessimistic view, then the side of thoughtfulness will have to win over the side of thoughtlessness. And in that greatest battle, I would hope that people like yourselves would all be battalion leaders. Thank you.
I said he was a teacher. He's a teacher and not one who, who he doesn't present us with sedatives. He, he shocks us a little bit and he's got some things here for us and I'm sure there are responses and uh, you've been asked to write questions that you wish to address to Dr. Halberner on cards. I hope I can get some of them very quickly. We, of course, will not be able to go through all of your questions, but uh, we have about 10 minutes now and we can uh, get as many of them as, as possible. question I have an uh, Before we get a question, uh, for uh, Mr. Chalmers in the audience is asked to report to the ticket booth. He has an urgent phone call. Here's some good questions. Uh, isn't it true that of the million IUDs in last installed in India, that's a nice word, installed, uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> a startling percentage were removed because of irritation, excessive bleeding, and so on. There, there is a natural re rejection rate. That is, not all women tolerate them. I think it's about 2%. But there's a natural retention rate, which is a lot larger. No, I don't think, it's, I don't think, the, the, I don't think that problem is, is severe. I dare say that there is some problem there. Do I think the jihad applies to this country? Hell no. Instead of nationalism, how about internationalism or worldism? I don't think that, that internationalism is, I think one has to try to be realistic, which is the most difficult of all attitudes, because it's so easy to fall into excesses of pessimism and excesses of optimism. But I think to expect too much by way of internationalism is to delude oneself at this moment in history. The bridges of internationalism are painfully built and slowly built, and the chances for world success will depend much more on national tolerances than on, than on spectacular international breakthroughs. Somebody raises the question about terror and whether it's worth it. That's a very good question. Let me repeat. If you go to the peasant himself in these countries and say, do you want to be modernized? He doesn't. He doesn't. The only reason that one preaches, somebody like myself preaches a jihad, is because I see something that poor peasant doesn't. I see the fact that he or his family is going to be extirpated unless something is done. When revolutions take place, whether they be the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, or any other revolution, people die. Furthermore, when historians go back and check on the credentials of the people who died, they turn out always to be so innocent. In fact, of the 40,000 people who were killed in the French Revolution, two-thirds or three-quarters were just common criminals taken out of jail, so it had nothing to do with the revolution, and they were heads chopped off. Not to speak of aristocrats whose records were spotless and who were good people. When revolutions break out, we always begin to count that we begin the calculus of corpses. But there is another calculus that we do not carry out to balance the books. All before the French Revolution, peasants in France were dying slowly because of lack of decent government, in fact. Today, the tens of thousands who are perishing around the world owe their deaths, in part, to the inability of some governments to do some things. The poor people in Calcutta, under some government or other, could be taken off those streets, put into some kind of camps, given some kind of ration, and put to some kind of decent work. I mean, their presence is, is somebody's guilt. 
so that there's a, a, a corpses pile up on both sides of the ledger. The calculus of corpses is a bad one and has no answer. I only suggest that the indignation we experience at terror and revolutions is, is shallow. That doesn't mean that one condones death. One never condones death. But that the indignation we display reflects only the horror on one side and fails to take into account that on the other. <clears throat> Some of this is just too tough. Isn't it true that the more food there's available, the more people will be born? And the fact that starvation is a natural population control, no matter how terrible it may seem. Yes, it's true. it is true. Malthus said that. That is the ultimate, there is an ultimate solution. The ultimate solution is when the number of people gets to that point at which the amount of food just supports that number of people and no more people, there'll be no more room. So that all these marvelous projections about we'll be standing on each other's heads will not come true because the people in the bottom will be dead. There is a natural remedy. What we would like to do is bring about a stabilization before the natural one is brought into effect. <clears throat> Vietnam. I think everybody knows how I feel about Vietnam. More Vietnam. No, I won't get into Vietnam. <laughs> I think that must be some kind of a signal to us. Oh. Very nearly. We have time for a, a couple of... All right. Uh, what, what role for the United States or for Americans in encouraging the development of jihads in areas where they may be needed? I don't think that it's our business to encourage jihads any more than I think it's our business to oppose them. Uh, I think these countries, in the end, must solve their problems by the rise of national leaders, whom we certainly can't select, uh, and that the best that we can do is to stand aside in, in some sort of position of, that combines a political responsibility and an economic tolerance. It's a very hard thing to describe. I think the Peace Corps is one of the great innovations. What I saw of Peace Corps young men and women abroad made me proud. And I think that is a kind of, of mild intervention, if it is intervention, that we can, it, that is a modernizing process, which we can do. Uh, but the Peace Corps leans over backwards, not to get mixed up in politics, and uh, I think we have little choice but to allow things to develop as they do. At the moment, of course, that's not what we do do. Now we intervene. When, at least four times, when radical governments arise, uh, we have done what we can to prevent these radical governments uh, from doing what they wanted to do in some cases successfully, in some cases not successfully. Let me also want to say that I'm desperately aware, as I'm sure you are, of the difficulties that this enjoins upon people who actually make foreign policy. It is one thing I full well know to stand up here in this easy atmosphere and tell you how bad the State Department is and, and suggest this larger worldview. Something quite else to be running the country, to be responsible to an electorate, not all of which is going to college, or if they have, going to the wrong colleges or listen to the wrong lecturers. <laughs> uh, it's something else uh, to know that you are dealing in a world in which modernization is not the only process, in which there are age-old rivalries of irrational kinds, aggressions, in which a certain kind of balance of power must be maintained because we are still at that primitive a level, in which, for example, if China moved into India, I would instantly be on India's side and think we should do something to stop China. I want India to do its own modernizing. I don't want China to modernize India for her. So I'm fully well aware of the fact that radical movements, when they arise, may often have foreign overtones, may often suggest that they are being financed by or run by other communist governments. So that the, the difficulty is very, is very real for the State Department. 
when to label a movement indigenous and when not. However, I also feel that up to the moment, we have erred very badly on calling any movement, radical movement, ipso facto the creature of foreign domination. And that, I think, is a, is a seriously grave error, which is leading us into Vietnam's, and which, if we do not correct it, correct it will lead us, alas, into many more Vietnam's, God forbid, for many more years. Thank you, Dr. Heilbrunner. I think at this point we're going to have to terminate this part of it. I'm sure that I express everyone's uh, appreciation when I say simply thank you very much for the stimulus that you have given us and our thinking. Now, there were many excellent questions here, which I got a chance to look at very briefly, and Dr. Heilbrunner didn't have a chance to answer. I hope that the people that ask those questions will come over, and many of the rest of you, for the reception and coffee hall to be held in the lounge just across the hall, uh, beginning as soon as we leave here. Thank you all very much for coming. We've been happy to have you, and hope that you will take part in the rest of these activities.